Uh, greetings and welcome on behalf of the Lumen Christi Institute. Uh, my name is Michael Le Chevalier. I'm acting executive director. It's a delight to be here human with you all together again uh, since we're looking at one of the great humanistic theologians today. Um, it's, a, it's a delight to come back in person. Um, and so thank you for joining us, uh, those joining us remotely, but also those joining us here in person. Um, uh, but especially to be bringing before you today um, a celebration of a work by Father Stephen Brock, uh, who, of course, not only is a regular fixture teaching here at the University of Chicago, um, and a regular part of our own weekly, an expert participant, not, not leader or teacher, but excellent participant, expert participant in our weekly Thomas Aquinas reading group. Um, but also since 2014, um, Father Brock has been helping Lumen Christi teach the teachers uh, through our Catholic Scholars Program, uh, through our week-long intensive seminars that take place during the summer um, on various topics and themes within Aquinas' thought. Um, I had the great privilege of participating in one of those seminars with Father Brock uh, in Rome uh, in 2015. Uh, and uh, it's a delight to, to have him continue to form students so that we can ensure um, that students can, can go on become those living dialogue partners of the Catholic intellectual trans tradition, transmitting it to wherever they get hired. Um, before turning it over to Stephen Waldorf for a fuller introduction of our panel, I also just want to call attention to two upcoming programs that we have. Um, in two weeks, on Thursday, April 28th, we will be hosting Brian Patrick McGuire, um, an expert in Cistercian thought um, and the thought of Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, who will be presenting um, on his new book, Bernard of Clairvaux, An Inner Life. It's really the first critical biography of Clairvaux that has, taken, that has been produced in over 100 years. Um, so please join us here, um, either virtually or here in person, uh, in two weeks. Um, that program actually will be uh, co-sponsored as well by the Martin Marty Center um, and the Bolandist Society. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the Bolandist Society, they've been around for 450 years, um, collecting the lives of saints and engaging with them critically. Uh, the subsequent day will be hosting a masterclass on friendship and monastic communities, also led by Brian Patrick McGuire. Um, you can find details for all of these events on our website. Um, we're able to hold events like these for free for students like you and faculty and staff, but also for our online audience uh, because of our various institutional partners and our donors. Um, I am grateful to Whip and Stock Publishers, the Department of History at the University of Chicago, and the Seminary Co-op Bookstore um, for helping um, produce today's event, for helping to make it successful. Um, I'm also grateful to all of our donors. And as we're still in a season of penance and almsgiving, I invite you, whether here in person or remote online, uh, to support Lumen Christi with our efforts to make these available for free. Um, first, by letting folks know about it. Um, second, by potentially making a financial gift yourself. Um, if you're looking for intellectual penance, a bibliography could be provided after uh, the event. Uh, but I wouldn't want you to confuse that uh, with uh, today's event. And so to celebrate Easter joy, I would also encourage you um, to follow the link that's provided that we have over there to purchase Father Steve's book um, today. Uh, but now to introduce our panel, I invite uh, uh, Stephen Waldorf, who is a Donnelly postdoctoral research fellow in the Department of History. Um, please. Well, thank you, Michael, for that introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here as the representative of the History Department. Um, and I see a number of students uh, from uh, the department who are in my natural law course, uh, and I hope you all find the, the presentation uh, very beneficial. And it's a pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker and panelists this evening. Um, so, as you know, we have uh, Father Stephen Brock here, who's a professor in visiting professor in the philosophy department. Um, we have joining us as well, Matthew Levering is our first panelist, who is the James and Mary Perry Professor of Theology at University of St. Mary of the Lake Mundelein Seminary, as well as the editor of Novit Vetera. 
Our second panelist is Professor Candace Vogler, uh, who is the David and Clara Stern Professor of Philosophy here at UChicago. And finally, we are joined by Russell Hittinger, who is professor at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley and the Dominican Seminary there, as well as visiting professor at UChicago Law School and senior fellow at the Lumen Christi Institute. So without further ado, we'll turn it over to Professor Brock. Well, thank you very much, Michael and Stephen. And thanks to the Lumen Christi Institute and also the History Department for organizing this event. Of course, I also want to give my heartfelt thanks to the distinguished members of the panel, friends, and I'm really looking forward to your comments afterwards. And thank everyone for coming. Now, I'm supposed to say a few words sort of about the drift of, of the book. I've written out some things because otherwise I could go on sort of indefinitely, but I'll try to keep them short. Leo Strauss once offered what I think is a pretty good first informal description of natural law. He called it, quote, the principles on which honest men act and have acted and will act as long as there are men. I might want to tweak that just a little bit, you know, but I think it pretty well captures what we could call the, the content of natural law. It consists of the first universal principles of morality. However, as Strauss, I think, would have been among the very first to acknowledge, or maybe even to insist, his description doesn't really tell us why we should be calling those principles a law. By contrast, St. Thomas's famous account of natural law does tell us that. He calls it the participation in God's eternal law that is proper to the rational creature. Now this, I argue that this is for Thomas, this is the formal definition of natural law. Right? It's because those principles express dictates of the eternal governor of the world that they are a law. That's why they are a law. But now there's an objection that comes up immediately to this. If these principles are a law only because they are ordained by a divine lawgiver, can we really call them natural? Is it a natural law? Even if, as Thomas certainly holds, the natural light of our reason makes all of us understand those principles to be true, they're truths about good and evil, truths about right and wrong. Is that enough for them to be functioning in a natural way as a law? Doesn't their functioning as God's law require that we, we understand them to be divinely instituted and divinely ordained, divinely promulgated? Thomas thinks that the princi those principles are self-evident to all of us. But very famously, he does not think that even God's existence, let alone his being a legislator, is self-evident to any of us. It's not self-evident to anyone, on his view. Now, some of Strauss's followers have, have suggested that on Thomas's account, natural law can really be known to be a law only by revelation and faith. That's the only way we can know that those principles are a law. Now, I think it's easy to show that that is not Thomas's view. He really does think that the principles of morality function as a law in some kind of natural way, without, even without revelation. But the question is, how exactly does that work? Now, a very prominent answer to that question, and one that's still adopted today by a number of serious readers of Aquinas, and it's a, is an answer given by that great Jesuit scholastic, Francisco Suarez. I'll try to sum it up just very, very briefly. 
So ours is answer starts with God as the creator. God has brought human nature into being. He's brought us into being together with the natural light of our reason. There's an order of right and wrong in human action that, he says, follows necessarily on our nature. And our reason naturally grasps at least the general principles of that order. Moreover, he argues, God, in his wisdom and in his goodness, must have willed to relate to us not only as our creator, as the father of lights, as Suarez calls him, but also as a provident governor. And this will of God's to govern us can't but include his willing to make the natural order of right and wrong be properly obligatory in the manner of a true law. He wills that it be a law. Moreover, although the truths of God's existence and God's legislative activity aren't quite self-evident to us, Suarez recognizes that, the natural light of reason can arrive at those truths quite easily, and in some real sense, then, naturally. If some people are ignorant of them, and so ignorant of natural law as a divine law, that's their own fault, Suarez says. They fail to exercise their reason about the world, about the cause of the world, in a way that reason itself inclines them to do. Now, I was never quite satisfied with Suarez's account here. It seems to me that there are some texts in St. Thomas that clearly Suarez's account just doesn't fit. But pinpointing the fundamental issue for me was, was not at all easy. In fact, I had not really found it, I think, when I submitted my doctoral thesis on this topic a long time ago. Now I think I have found the issue after about 30 years. So there is life after the doctorate, after all. Let me know that. <laughs> Luckily. Well, I'm not going to lay it all out now. I can't do that. That's in the book. Right? But let me just say a couple of things. Suarez's distinction, he makes that distinction between God as creator and God as governor. And I think it's, it sounds plausible. That sounds plausible because in our experience, the work of a governor presupposes the, the community, or at least the constituents of the community that he governs. And the nature and the conditions of those constituents, the members of the community, set certain parameters on the community's good. They set certain parameters on, on the common good of the community. The order to the common good that the governor institutes as a law, if it's going to be a rational order, it has to conform to those parameters and reinforce them. It can't go against them. But in the end, that's just not how Thomas conceives of God's legislative work. Neither the common good of God's community nor the order to it presuppose the community's constituents. On the contrary, the constituents, which are just creatures, the creatures, presuppose both the common good and his ordaining that they exist for the sake of the common good. And this is because the common good of God's community, what is it? Well, it is chiefly nothing other than God himself. It's a very simple point, that God is the highest and first common good. But I find that it's almost always overlooked in discussions of God's place in Thomas's moral thought. And it took me 30 years to hit upon it as the as I think it's kind of the key to the whole question. Because its first result is that we can say, I think we can say, for Thomas, creation itself is a work of divine governance. And our very natures are effects of God's law, as a law. And he says that. So I think that Suarez made a mistake, and it was to treat the eternal law after the fashion of a positive law. I think, and we tend to do that, it's very easy to do that, but 
that's what we shouldn't do. And the other result of that, that way of seeing things is that the naturally known principles of morality can very well be functioning in us as a full-fledged law, God's law, even before we become aware of God's existence or of his governance. In Thomas's account, I think we can see that they do that, among other things, because from the very start of the moral life, on his view, from the very beginning, when we were very young, the light of reason is urging us in a very kind of peremptory way in a direction that, in the end, can only be called a Godward direction, even though we wouldn't first call it that. It's, that's the only direction that it's going in. And this, by the way, is one of the reasons, there are others, why I think that we have to say that the proper account of natural law for, in Thomas's philosophy, anyway, is a metaphysical thing. It pertains to metaphysics. So that's really all I wanted to say. There were a, there a few other issues uh, that the reading of Thomas, which I'm proposing, uh, had to address a number of other smaller issues. How natural law relates to uh, Aristotle's natural right, how it's obligatory for us, especially how human nature natural inclinations, natural things in general figure into the understanding of natural law. I just, the last thing I want to say that on that last point about nature, natural inclinations, I find that unfortunately I'm kind of at odds, at odds with almost everybody who's written about that topic recently. But it doesn't bother me too much because I've made sure to agree with at least one author and that is my late lamented teacher, Father Lawrence Dewan. Okay. And if you know his work, I think you'll understand why I say it, why I put it that way. And the, the, the book owes a lot, owes a great deal to Father Dewan. So, thank you. Okay, can, can you hear me? It's a tremendous honor to be here uh, speaking on Father Brock's uh, book. And I did have the pleasure of knowing Father Dewan also, so he, and truly an amazing man, and, and the book, he would love the book. Um, and I wish, I wish that, I wish I'd written on the natural inclinations, because that really is the heart, the, um, to me, the, uh, the most exciting part of, of the book. But instead, uh, let, me, let me read to you just some, uh, something else that I wrote. In his 2016 study, Black Natural Law, the, the theologian Vincent Lloyd argues the following. The Black Natural Law tradition addresses the same problems addressed by other natural law traditions, but it offers more coherent and compelling responses. Where other natural law traditions start with accounts of human nature that only partially capture our humanity, for example, understanding humans as directed toward natural ends in the same way as animals or other elements of the physical world, or understanding human nature as essentially rational, black natural law appreciates the mix of reason, emotion, and imagination that make, makes up our humanity. And black natural law concludes that human nature is ultimate, ultimately unrepresentable." End quote. Due to his focus on American figures, such as Frederick Douglass, Lloyd does not attend to important recent engagements with natural law within African Catholic ethics. Intriguingly, however, the above paragraph has affinities with a position taken by the African theologian Benazé Bujo in his Foundations of an African Ethic against, against reliance upon European natural law reasoning. Bujo emphasizes the imaginative and nonverbal dimensions of moral reasoning, as well as the centrality of community building and dialogue for negotiating moral norms and resolving moral conflicts. Bujo's work, in turn, has prompted a significant response by Paulinus Odazor in his morality, truly Christian, truly African. Odazor defends the place of natural law reasoning within a God-centered and Christ-centered ethics. For Odazor, natural law and its commitment to universal human nature and universal moral norms help to ensure that ethics does not become a matter of the strongest voice running roughshod over the weaker. 
In this conversation, the perspective of Father Stephen Brock can be of much help. Brock's book, The Light That Binds, makes clear both the limits and the foundations of natural law. Brock is well aware that a community of instruction is needed not only for natural law reasoning, but also for living in accordance with natural law. At the same time, Brock offers an exalted portrait of human rationality that displays its important place within the moral life as intended by the creator. So now some comments on Stephen Brock's account of Aquinas on natural law. What Brock does is to show both how extraordinarily rational natural law is, while also showing how deeply insufficient human reason and therefore natural law ethics is. Let me begin with the insufficiency of natural law. As Brock remarks, quote, for Thomas Aquinas, law and obligation do always refer to life and community and to common good. And he does not think that even the whole set of conclusions that can be drawn from the precepts of natural law suffice to regulate any community, human or divine, to which human beings actually belong, end quote. Aquinas holds, for instance, that in order to perceive that lying as distinct from giving false testimony is wrong, people generally need instruction. Natural law doesn't suffice, even though lying is a violation of natural law. Aquinas argues that people can generally see that committing adultery is wrong, and the natural law generally suffices in this regard. But according to Aquinas, as Brock points out, quote, the prohibition of fornication and even the prohibition of the so-called sins against nature pertain to the instruction of the wise, end quote. After all, Aquinas is aware that some pagan cultures did not consider fornication to be sinful, and of course, neither did some pagan cultures consider male same-sex acts to be sinful. The point is that natural law by itself, without instruction by God or wise teachers, does not for Aquinas suffice for making ethical norms known. At a basic level, natural law is never absent in human persons. Brock speaks of, quote, the practical reasons, common principles, which are the primary precepts of natural law and which require no instruction, end quote. Aquinas holds that these primary precepts or principles are held in the human mind through the habit of syndaresis. Or is it synderesis? I can't remember. But in most cases of moral reasoning, it remains the case that, quote, without instruction, the matter is not immediately clear, end quote, even though, quote, natural law absolutely considered does order all acts of virtue, at least in a general, confused way, end quote. Given the complexity of human action and human flourishing and given human fallenness, the reality of natural law known by the mind does not entail that human communities can make do without the teaching of God or the wise. On the contrary, often, quote, instruction is needed in order to clarify that order, i.e. the ordering toward the acts of virtue, or to specify its requirements, end quote. We need God's instruction to live in accord with the order of reason and to possess, quote, complete rectitude of reason, end quote. Brock affirms, affirms that the natural law, far from being sufficient as such for human, let alone Christian ethics, quote, only provides starting points, common principles, end quote, for what, quote, human beings need for life in any community, divine or human, end quote. Indeed, Brock comments powerfully that, quote, under the conditions of sin, even many of the precepts that belong to natural law absolutely, and indeed, the most important of them seem to need divine help, not only for actual compliance with them, that certainly requires grace, but also for a more than tenuous, merely notional or theoretical hold on them, end quote. This point should lay to rest any notion of natural ethics as sufficient in itself. That said, Human rationality as participation in the divine light is an extraordinary thing, according to Brock. Natural law is promulgated by God and created human nature as the created light of reason. In an important basic sense, everyone knows natural law. For Aquinas, it doesn't require knowing that God exists or that God is the source of natural law in order to possess natural law. Natural law is promulgated by God, in other words, even in those who do not know that God promulgates it. For Aquinas, as Brock says, quote, atheists have conscience too. They do so even if they deny it. And this is because they know the common precepts of natural law, end quote. Brock rejoices in human rationality as a participation in the divine light. 
As Brock makes clear, quote, it is God who promulgates natural law by instilling the light of reason into our minds and thereby making the law something that we naturally come to understand, end quote. Human reason is the source of natural law, but God is the prior and determinative source as creator. The fact that God is the ultimate source of natural law does not mean that natural law is not natural. On the contrary, natural law involves, quote, man's natural knowledge of the first principles of practical reason. These first principles are not revealed to human beings by God, but rather are known by human reason. Natural law has its authoritative force from God in one sense, but in another sense, the force of natural law is known by reason as such, because reason knows that the principles of natural law are true. Overall, Brock's account of the working of human reason and natural law is an exalted one. As Brock states in reflecting upon the mind's relation to non-rational nature, quote, what human reason primarily imitates is divine reason, end quote. At the same time, his account of human rationality is refreshingly humble and down to earth. Natural law is earthly and insufficient, and yet natural law is also a sign of the greatness and power of human rationality in all cultures. Thank you. everyone. Um, it's a real honor to be here talking about this extraordinary book um, that I started preparing myself to read back when it was just uh, an available in PDF form online <laughs> doctoral dissertation for many years. Um, and there's two really striking aspects of the book for me. Um, that were both of which were present in an earlier form in the dissertation. One is just the discussion of the legality of natural law and the sense in which the natural law <laughs> is an ordinance of reason promulgated by someone who has care of the community, in this case, God. But what fascinates me the most is the discussion of the sense in which the law is promulgated in nature. <laughs> And I find this still, sort of even with the help of the book, a really difficult topic. Partly because on the one hand, you've got this, the exalted and to some extent abstract discussion of the sort of good toward which the natural law is directing us, which is God, which is beatitude, which is beatific union in a resurrected life. And that is the end right, that we're directed toward by the divine light of reason in us. It's ultimately perfective of our nature. Good in general is tied up with an understanding of what per perfects a being. So there's very abstract and exalted understandings. And then <laughs> there's the very abstract first principle which tells us that good is to be pursued or promoted and evil is to be avoided, where evil is understood as a privation of some good. That's very abstract and very powerful and may, I'm, I believe that it's actually a condition on the intelligibility of animal movement generally. <laughs> Um, and human movement in particular, that if you can't see um, a kind of creature moving toward something that is good or perfective for a creature of that kind, you don't understand what you're seeing. You can't I even identify the kind of creature in question as an individual instance of the kind of creature in question. All that is, I think, very powerful and true. It is very hard to go from there to an understanding of the sense in which we actually become aware of the precepts in the course of leading an ordinary human life. 
Um, and I'm a great fan of the confused grasp of these things um, and feel like I have a better sense of the confused grasp than of the properly philosophical <laughs> grasp. I mean, getting the two together can be sort of difficult. And the places <laughs> where I go to begin to understand something about the confused grasp are on things like the way that small children actually acquire language through universal terms, not through particulars. It's very hard to actually acquire knowledge of a bare particular. It's really hard to know what that would even mean. <laughs> Right. Um, according to my mother-in-law, my husband's first word was rice. This was the name of a kind that included rice, cereal, pasta, potatoes, and bread. <laughs> um, and so he would um, occasionally say, as a little, little guy, that what he wanted for breakfast was rice, which could mean toast or cereal or you know, potatoes with his eggs, any of these things, right? But it was, he, the mind was going toward a universal form even before it could have articulated the concept involved. It was his parents who understood the concept that was being expressed, not, not, not Hank um, at three or something, right? So there's a, there's a part of the way, according to Father Brock's reading of Aquinas, that we acquire, that this stuff is promulgated for us in nature, is in our basic understanding of the kinds of things around us, the kinds of beings, and their characteristic modes of activity and movement. And that is a first and confused understanding of the sense in which the end is good. That the good of the thing in question has the character of an end. Dogs chasing rabbits, dandelions growing, things, hummingbirds feeding at the honeysuckle vine. These are all aspects in which we begin to understand the sense in which good has the character of an end. It's good for the kind of thing in question and part of a way that natural law is promulgated to us in nature is through our understanding of the other beings around us, the kinds of creatures and what characterizes their movements. And of course, for Aquinas, those tendencies, inclinations, are there even in inanimate nature, right? So the fire is inclined to burn, and that's how the fire shows it does what fire does. Right? So it's the fire loving the tinder dry forest that can cause great alarm in a place like California, right? given a wind. <laughs> okay. Um, it's in understanding those kinds of things, that's part of the way in which the primary precept of natural law gets promulgated to us in nature on this reading of Aquinas. And it's very smart reading of Aquinas, I think. Um, so much so that I'm inclined to just sort of assume that what Father Brock teaches me is the proper reading of Aquinas on natural law. I get the two confused, although I can have Father Brock over for supper and, and Aquinas, I just ask for help um, <laughs> discerning things. But the way that you go from these through the kind of exercise of basic sociality that has to do with taking in instruction and being guided, that's part of the way in which the natural law is naturally promulgated in the ordinary life of a human being on this reading. And I find this incredibly powerful, even though it's not always clear to me how to actually translate the kind of apprehension that's involved in just understanding what's happening around me, what things are moving toward, what their characteristic activities are like, what kinds of things they're after, um, and something like don't lie, <laughs> or don't commit adultery, or um, you owe this to your parents, or something like that, the kinds of basic, basic 
precepts that are common among human beings generally. How these get articulated from the general business of growing up strikes me as a complicated matter and hard to give a singular account of. But for me, part of the real power of this book is the multifaceted discussion of the way in which it's natural for us to have access to a knowledge of the truths of the natural law and how we go about acquiring them. So this is just a, a big thank you, really, for helping that make more sense to me. There's only one required secondary reading. There's a list of more than one, but only one required, and it's this book. And uh, we just finished it. We, we just got through the Lex Fetus. Why didn't you do another chapter on the Lex Nova? Well, that's another one. Uh, in, in my view, this is the most complete and coherent interpretation of natural law, at least as it's found in the Summa of Theology. And one of the reasons it's the most complete and coherent is Father Brock's method, which is to pay attention to every objection and reply, and to run the definitions forward and backward in the Summa, from prima pars all the way, <laughs> and back again. And it turns out paying attention to objections and replies uh, it lands him on the key insight. I'm not sure this is the one that took 30 years, but I've done it for 30 years and I never noticed it until it was in your book. Well, in question 90 of the treatise on law, Prima Secunde, that part of the Summa, uh, Thomas sets out to give not a merely nominal but an essential definition of law. That is, an essential definition can be verified universally uh, in anything that's law, in whatever mode. And it has four uh, aspects. Law per is, pertains to reason, chiefly, presupposing the will, but the ratio of reason, without it, there's really nothing to will. Yep. at least not in a legal fashion, uh, that it's done for a common good. Doesn't, probably the prime example of that is political, but that one can be analogical. Uh, by a competent authority and promulgated. By the way, many, if not most, Thomistic commentators of the 20th century on question 90, which gives the essential definition of law, really don't pay attention to question 90. Because I think it's supposed that question 90 is only a kind of definition uh, key to human law and to human positive law, actually. Uh, but paying attention to that definition really does yield a fantastic insight, and let me call your attention to what it is and where it is. In that definition of law, Article 4 is on the topic of promulgation. And to understand what is happening there, uh, Father Brock pays attention to the first objection. It's the first objection that yields the insight. 
Now, the objector wants to object that every law requires promulgation. And the objector makes two points. First, the natural law has the maximum of legality. That is, of any law that fits the definition, four points of the definition, natural law satisfies it the most. It fulfills the four criteria of law, and therefore, natural law needs no promulgation. That is, uh, promulgation is not one of the essential parts of law. And therefore, Thomas should only have three prongs or parts of law, that it is uh, an act of reason, that it is for a common good and is made by competent authority, but it doesn't need to be promulgated. And now we turn to the reply to the objection. And Thomas affirms the first part of the objection. Uh, but of course, but of course, natural law has the maximum of legality, satisfying to the utmost and most clearly uh, uh, the, the, the four aspects of law. But uh, it is a promulgation. This is what Father Brock was just talking about. It so successfully promulgated, instilled in, and in moving the human intellect that it doesn't need another kind of promulgation, a more ordinary kind of promulgation. You know, like with a bullhorn or a sheet of do's and don'ts that you put up on the wall surrounding the town. Yes, it is so much satisfies to the maximum the ontological structures and requirements of law that it is so successfully promulgated, uh, we hardly notice it, but it's there. Uh, and the word natural, as Father Brock contends, it's absolutely true, it's, it's naturaliter. It's naturally known. It's the mode of knowing that is the term natural. Nature does not, does not, uh, is, is not a lawgiver, right? Nature doesn't in, in and of itself produce a ratio for a human act. Natural comes from the way it's known as being instilled in our minds. But here, I mean, this is a brilliant insight. I mean, I, I read the entire book around this insight, it's so startling. Uh, then we, we have to ask ourselves, why wait for 200 plus questions in the Summa? Why did he wait for 200 plus questions? And uh, Father Brock points out, objection one, 94.4, is the first time he explicitly uses the term natural law in the Summa. 202 questions or something have already elapsed. Why did he wait? Why do we have to infer it through an objection and the reply to it? And Father Brock reasons this way, which, which I'm buying. He couldn't give a formal definition of natural law until he'd given a definition of law. And so, in the fourth article of question 90 on promulgation, he concludes with the definition of law. An act of reason, command, for the common good, made by competent authority and promulgated. And the very next sentence is the reply. And he uses for the first time in the Summa the term natural law. In a way, the first yield of the essential definition is to affirm part of what the objector is saying. The formal definition, however, does not come until question 91, article two, right? Uh, that natural law is our participation in, in the eternal law. Uh, as I say, I've been teaching this for years, but I never paid attention to the first objection in, in 
Question 90, uh, Article 4. Uh, Father Brock does pay attention to these things. Although one part of the brilliance of the book is his skill in kind of reassembling all of the factors that have to be put together. Uh, one other way he does this is in chapter seven by paying, paying advent, uh, attention to the Lex Vetus, the old law, which really does need to be understood by a natural lawyer. It's much n neglected to the peril of the reader and the interpreter of this tradition. Uh, Aquinas's most complete discussion of a concrete historical legal institution is Jewish law, not Roman law, not Greek law, not canon law even. It, it's the Lex Vetus, because in Jewish law we have concretely and historically not only the moral precepts of the law, which come from the natural law, but we have ceremonial precepts teaching us uh, how we are to give some basic justice due to God, and judicial precepts, which uh, govern our relations to neighbors in various and sundry way. Uh, interestingly, it's in the Lex Vetus, especially in question 98 and then again in 100, that Aquinas actually gives his clearest understanding of the relationship between first precepts of natural law, uh, proximate conclusions drawn from them, and very distant type of conclusions. It's clearer in Lex Vedas than it is in Question 94. And one of the reasons I'm, I would propose that it's clear, he's dealing with a concrete legal system, historical legal system and he can actually point to what they were doing and what the system was yielding. Uh, and, and so here's something I would like to propose, or I, I would like the answer to. How are we supposed to teach this? Because I notice what makes the book so compelling is, uh, by the way, I didn't make a word count on this, but Father Brock surely quotes or cites as many or more passages elsewhere in the Summa than what is quoted or cited about questions 91 and 94. How, I mean, do you teach this in the same order that you've written the book, leaving chapter one out for a moment, beginning with chapter two? How are we supposed to do it? I mean, what's, what's the secret method on doing this? Thank you, Steve. I, I very much enjoyed the book. That was, that was very interesting, very helpful. Um, yeah, I just sort of agree with everything. I don't, have, <laughs> I don't have a lot to say. I think it is very important, Professor Lever Levering, the, 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 that idea. I, I'm, I'm glad it came out. I wasn't sure I'd stressed it enough. The natural law isn't a self-contained body of law for any community. It's just principles okay, for any, any human community. But by itself, it doesn't suffice. It wouldn't even suffice. Um, without sin, right? Certainly doesn't suffice with sin, in the, in the conditions of <laughs> sin, right? We need a lot of help besides what natural law gives us. But even without sin, because it only, if you just, that distinction that Thomas makes between conclusions and determinations, there are, pot, there are determinations according to the concrete circumstances that can't, just can't be deduced, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're not things you can deduce. You, can, you, only, you have to look and see and apply the law to the, the particulars, and that's not a deduction, right? That's not a, a demonstration. So that's very important. So I'm, I'm, I thank you for bringing that out. Um, 
what Professor Vogler says, I th it's certainly true that Thomas, you know, Thomas is, um, as Father Duan puts it in another context, Thomas tends to live in this kind of heaven of immobility, doesn't he? That, that he doesn't tell us much about how the, the process of the generation of our understanding of, the, of natural law or of principles generally. How do the principles of speculative reason come into our heads? And it's partly through the experience of natural things. It's partly through our sociality and talking and hearing. And he just doesn't, that wasn't his concern really. And, and when he talks about what comes first and second, it's more in a structural sense. What's more general is prior to what's more particular. Prior in, in some kind of logical sense and causal sense, but not as a matter of the process. So that's kind of your job, I think, is to, <laughs> is to, is to sort out how this actually happens. I, I don't think we're, he's going to give us a lot more help, you know. But, um, and I thank you, Professor Hittinger, for the, the pointing out that I've, I've actually sort of forgotten about that. That objection really is important, <laughs> you're right. It's pretty fundamental. Um, and why didn't I discuss the new law? You asked that very quickly. Yeah, I, I suppose I should have. There's not the, it doesn't, he doesn't really discuss natural law much within the context of his discussion of the new law. He does make a distinction there, which is, and I didn't, I didn't point this out, you know, and it, part of my, the discussion in the book is, is a kind of conversation with, as I mentioned briefly, some of the followers of Leo Strauss, and they make a big deal out of a distinction that comes up in later classes in between a, a mere lex indicans and a lex principiens, a lex that just sort of shows you what's right and wrong but doesn't command you to do it. Okay. And, lex, and a law that does command you. But Thomas doesn't make that distinction. He has the word lex indicans. It shows up in the text section on the new law. That the new law, the natural law, is a light that indicates what's right and wrong. But I think he would want to see it also commands. But the contrast is not between that and something that commands. It's between that and something that helps. Lex adjuvans. And, that, and the new law is a lex adjuvans because it's primarily the grace of the Holy Spirit. That's what it is, chiefly, right? And that's the contrast. But I think I would just leave that to the theologians. That's, that's, over, my, that's, that's, that's over my head, how to sort out the relations. That's your job. More than. Um, but as to how to teach this stuff, I've never actually taught this, so I don't have a... I don't, <laughs> I, I, I don't have an answer to that question. I guess you just have to read the first, the first part and then the second part of the Summa. I suppose that's the way to do it. <laughs> but in, nine, in a nine-week quarter, you can't really do that, can you? So we'll have to figure out. I don't know what else to say about that. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Um, you kind of talked about that um, um, natural law insofar as natural is because kind of like um, there's a rationality in human beings. There's a tendency like early in life we kind of acquire it. What if someone say that, you know, there are multiple tendencies that made us distinct from other, let's say, animals or species. For example, someone could say, you know, we are, uh, we, we follow a moral code. Or someone could say like we are like um, empathetic. I don't know. There's like a lot of, I feel like there's a lot of room for interpretation here. I'm just wondering does um, Aquinas offer any guidance in this subject? Thank you. For Aquinas, what matters the most is that we're rational. We're the rational animals. And that sets us apart from other animals. And by rational, he means that we're operating with discursive reason. Okay? So it's, um, it's like when contemporary philosophers get really excited by the fact that we, uh, we are language users. Right? It's a similar sort of a point and a similar take on what it is to be rational. Um, on Professor Brock's reading, to say that something is rational is already to say that it's an animal because the other forms of intellect don't operate by composition and division in the way that human beings do. So it's our rationality that winds up being the most important feature of us for Aquinas. Now, 
there's no tendency to suppose that that is a, a, an especially narrow <laughs> intellectualist in the mm -hmm. contemporary sense understanding of what it is to be rational. It's, it's more that, at least on my reading of Aquinas, which I'm hopeful is in line with Professor Brock's, that we're rational animals has a tendency to alter the way in which we are, for example, sentient. Right. Um, and other things as well. Okay. Um, it doesn't, when he's talking about our inclinations, they are inclinations of the will that makes them rational inclinations. That doesn't mean that they've got super scientific content or something. It, it means that they are um, discursively or conceptually shaped and directed, which is how come if I'm having um, a bad episode of pettiness or something, I can sometimes get myself out of it by giving myself a talking to. It's mm -hmm. like my passions actually want to be rational. I think just continuing on this subject, I believe that for St. Thomas, law is only in a mind. It, it has no other place to be than in a mind. So, for example, if we're setting, if we're standing at an intersection and we see the light turn red and the cars, or at least most of them, stop, right? We can figure out right away, it's not the color red that's making the car stop. Okay. <laughs> uh, and it's not the driver's hands and feet, although those are instruments. But the driver has understood the, the, the signal and has interpreted it correctly to stop. Right. Um, law is actually only in a mind, primarily the mind of he who gives it, right? but secondarily and importantly in the mind of those who receive it. And this is why he later distinguishes uh, two kinds of virtues that have to go together. One is he calls regnative prudence, the prudence of whoever rules, and but what he calls political prudence is on the part of the recipient who has to get it into his mind, appropriate it, and make, or well, perform the action, right? So uh, for Aquinas, law is not chiefly in a body. It's not those kinds of natural laws. It is not like the second law of thermodynamics. It is not chiefly in the will, although it does presuppose the will. Uh, it's, it's not chiefly in a book or in a light. It's chiefly in a mind. He's a thoroughgoing intellectualist on this, which in this he stands apart from most legal theorists in our entire history, I would say. Question. I think it's that's the question of natural inclinations is really maybe the most contentious part of the book. I mean, I, I'd argue it against Suarez, but Suarez uh, was several centuries ago, and mm, and the the issue kind of revolves around what the, the what is certainly the most famous and most cited passage of the Summa on natural law, which is. Uh, Prima Secundi, question 94, article 2, right? which is long, it's a brilliant piece of work. Mm, but there's one sentence in, it w in which Thomas says that all the things to which man is naturally inclined, reason naturally apprehends as good, and therefore as to be sought in action, and the contraries of those things as bad and as to be avoided. And it's very easy to read that passage. In fact, I read it that passage until I, until I came across Father Duan's 
view on the matter. I read that passage as saying that we have these inclinations and as a result of these inclinations, reason judges the object of those inclinations to be good. And that's the way most people read it. Okay. But that just doesn't go through. That reading doesn't go through. It, 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 it's fraught with problems. I, I listed a number of them in the book. Um, and I think if you read that article in the whole context, especially the, in light of the a prior article, the article in which Thomas shows the existence of a natural law in the first place, it turns out it's got to be the other way around for many reasons. Mm, that it's because reason understands certain, naturally understands certain, certain things to be good, that man is naturally inclined to them. Now Thomas is perfectly well, is perfectly well aware that, there, that we have non-rational inclinations, inclinations we, that mm, are at work in us and that some of which we, ex we experience quite independently of reason's grasp of good and evil. And those, but those vary from person to person. Those are mostly inclinations that arise from our bodily dispositions, which are not inclinations of man as man, not, not inclinations common to the whole species. And he's very explicit. The inclinations common to the species, which is what he's talking about here, are those that derive from reason, those that derive from reason's understanding of good and evil. So it is very intellectualist, but as Kant is saying, it's not you have to have a very, you have to have a sort of a Thomistic understanding of intellect at the same time. That it's not simply for the good of reason, that is for the sake of truth. That is, that's certainly one of the goods, that's one of the main goods of the human being is truth. But it's not only for that, it's all the things that reason understands to be good for human beings, starting with our existence. But it's all those things under, that we tend toward through our understanding of them, and that is the, the tendencies of our will, and it's the understanding of them that makes those tendencies so strong, that it's intellectual inclination that's, that for Thomas is the strongest kind of inclination, because it can, it can tend to, toward the good, the goods under, apprehended in, a, in what he calls a kind of absolute way, an unrestricted way. So for example, he says, all things, all substances, and we sort of see this in the world, tend toward their own existence, right? To tend to maintain themselves in existence and resist being destroyed, right? And they tend toward the, 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 the preservation of their kind. Well, but only human beings are able to grasp existence in a kind of absolute way, he says. Other things, other animals, he does say other animals grasp, and he says they grasp being, Okay, to be, but in the, only in the here and now. So they, they tend toward being here and now. But we can tend toward being absolutely and for all time. And so we have a desire for immortality. And not only for ourselves as individuals, but for the, we can worry about the, the humankind as such. Okay? And other animals can't do that. And, and that's because we're intellectual. Okay? Uh, so it's not a narrowing of the of the inclinations that interest him as regards natural law. It's not a restriction, on the contrary, it's what liberates our possibility, the possibility of inclination toward the good. Yeah. Yes, Karen. Um, you said that um, the natural law in this reading is really a metaphysical thing. I'm wondering if we could just sort of stand on that and see, or sort of uh, show us like, why that's an alternative and what we might think it is. Okay. So if you could just repeat the question for a moment. Okay, the question was um, why is natural law a metaphysical thing and what that sort of means? Well, I think that it means several things. Um, one is we're talking about first principles. Mm. In this case, first principles is a practical reason, but, but first principles. Okay. And any discourse, any fundamental discourse about first principles in any field of human inquiry or human knowledge for Thomas is a metaphysical uh, endeavor. It belongs to metaphysics, he says, to pin down, it doesn't deduce all the first principles, they really are first principles, they're self-evident. You can't 
deduce self-evident principles. So, so that practical reason does have its own starting points, which are not deduced from other things that metaphysics. But it belongs to metaphysics, he says, to pin down the very meanings of the terms that the principles consist in, and therefore to judge the truth of the principles, and really to formulate the principles, I would say. This is, I think this is really important, you know, as Candace was pointing out, the little, the little child somehow understands natural law, but it's not as though the child has formulated the precepts of natural law. We, we understand in light of the principles, and that's true of the speculative principles too, con non-contradiction and all that. We'd, it's very few people formulate or even try to formulate the principles, and that's the metaphysician who does it. So that's one reason, I think, why. And this is already kind of contentious, I mean, the, uh, and it gets, it gets more so when you say that, well, for Thomas, um, the primary term that, we had, that the metaphysician has to pin down here is the good, right? And, and there is such a thing for Thomas as the nature of the good. Right? There is what it is to be good, and that's very much a function of the natures, the natures of things, right, and the being of things. And in saying that, I'm kind of going very much against a, a very prominent kind of understanding of natural law. It's called the new natural law theory. I don't know if you've heard of that. Well, it's okay, it doesn't um, Which tries very much to divorce uh, natural law from any metaphysical commitments about the world or about being, or, and its practical reason functioning entirely on its own without being fed at all by the understanding of being or the understanding of truth or anything like that. And really, I don't think that's Thomas at all. You know. And then, as I was saying, it, it's, it's metaphysical also because it's going, here I think we'd have to say, this is kind of connected with the question with the, the, with Strauss, the Straussians. The Straussians, I think, are right to say that there's a difference between Thomas's natural law and Aristotle's natural right. They insist on that difference. Um, among other things, because Aristotle doesn't connect it with God. Right? He doesn't make it a law that's imposed on, it, uh, on us. Now, they see a kind of tension, you know, because um, Thomas's natural law seems a good deal more definite and, as they would say, kind of rigid than Aristotle's natural right. That seems to be more flexible. I'm inclined to think that they make it a little too flexible, as though in an extreme circumstance you could do anything. I don't think Aristotle is saying that. In fact, I think he's clear he's not. He says, but it is true that Thomas's um, natural law is a good deal more rigorous, but it's a good deal more rigorous because, and I think he understands that it's more rigorous than Aristotle's natural right, because Aristotle's natural right is a purely political thing. It's natural political justice, and Aristotle says that. Right? Whereas for Thomas, justice is only a part of morality, and in relation to God, all of morality is bumped up to the level of a law and something obligatory, and it's more demanding in relation to God. So it's, it, it's political, but it's more than political. And at the, in the philosophical domain, I'd say the more is metaphysical, right, in that sense. Does that sort of, okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so I have a question from our online audience, Gaston Lenotre. Um, and I'll, I'll summarize this question down a bit. Uh, but basically says that uh, in a 2015 book, Steve Jensen um, identifies that uh, Aquinas' uh, use of the natural inclination text, or the, that particular text, uh, includes both concupiscible and irascible appetites, uh, and not just the intellectual appetites. So he asked, how do you handle this text? How do you respond <laughs> to this thesis? And then for the rest of our audience, what's at stake? in this question. Um, yeah, uh, th that's a good question. Steve is a very good friend of mine. We're very good friends. And we agree on almost everything. I think this is the one point that we don't agree on right here. <laughs> and, and he pointed it out. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so uh, Steve tells me he's writing another book on a kind of a, a more popular level book on natural law, and he's going to try to sort this out one more time. So we're going to see what is right. But uh, he's more inclined to say that that uh, the natural inclinations that Thomas is talking about 
are the, what Thomas and Thomas does have these, have inclinations that are intrinsic to the powers, to the human powers, right? I mean, part of what's at stake is just that text that I mentioned, right? And, and um, Thomas will say that there are, the natural law also has to do with the inclinations of the concupiscible appetite and the irascible appetite, which are sense appetites and not the will. That natural law pertains to those somehow. My take on that is, is from things that Thomas says in various places, that is that the inclinations of the irascible appetite and the concupiscible appetite are um, a reflection of natural law or are in accordance with the natural law only to the extent that they flow from reason, that those appetites are under the command of reason. And he kind of says that. Right? Where Steve wants to say, no, those, inclin those appetites they have their own natures. The passions, he's perfectly aware that for Thomas, the passions, the acts, particular acts of the sense appetites can go astray. In fact, that's, for Thomas, that's kind of how we usually go astray is because of the influence. We're not angels. You know. The mind can go astray by itself, but for us, it's mostly the passions, right? But those powers, the natures of those powers have a certain kind of inclination of their own, and that's good because that belongs to their natures. And I think that's, it's true that they're good, but I, I just don't think that's what Thomas is talking about there uh, in that text. That favors the reading of the text that I was talking about before that I don't quite agree with. Um, because we don't know the natures of the powers as such. That's not a source of our knowledge of, like, it's, only, it's only in a lot of reflection that we even identify the existence of those powers. I mean, that's sort of, you have to have read Aristotle or something in order to know, to break down the human soul in those ways. Um, so that's kind of, that's, sorry, that's kind of a long-winded answer to the question. He, but he's trying to, he's in favor of the reading according to which the natural inclinations are prior to reason's understanding and re, of, the good, of good and bad, and that, that's the source of reason's understanding of good and bad. And he's trying to find that in the, 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 very inclinations of the parts of our nature toward their objects, which I grant that those inclinations exist, but I just don't see how that, that can function as the source of reason's understanding. So it's basically that. It's a very theoretical kind of issue, that's for sure. In practice, I think we come down to the same conclusions. Um, one way, perhaps, to get a hold of this is, that, is to suppose that Thomas in question 94, article two, and indeed throughout the entire church and so on. He's, not, he's talking about an octus humanus. He's not talking about an octus hominis, things that are just happening inside, inside us. So, for example, uh, is someone really irascible if they're sound asleep? Now, we can see them, or maybe they're tumbling in a dream or something, right? Or are they really concupiscible just because completely knocked out, they lick their lips because there's something sweet on it. I don't think that's what Thomas is talking no, about either. here. He's, it's the concupiscible and the irascible conjoined with our proper form, which is rational. Uh, now you can say concupiscible both about things that are happening automatically with no understanding, no octus humanus, a truly human act. And you can use it also for irascibility for the whole package. But the moral vice is the whole package. Right. If we have sure. moral good and evil, it, it can't just be, um, how to put it, the physical nature. Right, yeah. right. that's right. Actually, one other, maybe more practical, point in this, in, uh, in this line, this, some of this came up in the course I thought about in the first quarter on, on justice, that when Thomas talks about punishment, and uh, either in, the general, in punishment in general, or in a, for a particular individual who, has to, who reacts against wrongdoings to himself, and there's a virtue that has to do with what, that's called what, what Thomas calls vindicatio, uh, which can't be translated as revenge because he thinks revenge is bad. 
but vindication or something like that. Right? Um, and he says there's a natural inclination to this, to rise up against, uh, against attacks and against, against injuries and to, and to kind of fight back. There's a natural inclination in all things to do that, right? And reason, and that's why, that's why this is the basis for that, for the, the virtue of vindicatio and the basis for punishment. And, and a lot of people read him as saying, well, the basis, the real basis for our understanding of it, for the need for punishment is the fact that we get angry. And that just can't be right, because there's a text very early in the Summa when Thomas talks about the same external action can be either an action of virtue or an action of vice, and he's talking about an act of punishment. It's an act of virtue if it proceeds from the desire for justice, and it's an act of vice if it proceeds from anger, and it's that you're only trying to satisfy your anger. That's vicious, right? So it can't be the sense appetite that's the source of the understanding here. It can't, it just can't be. That's a, that's, that turns everything on its head, I think. And that's a very practical question, I think, that. Very concrete. Okay. Well, uh, here at Lumen Christi, we are um, conscious that uh, certain irascible appetites are <laughs> pushed out of the room. Um, but also that we are fully embodied creatures, and so not only have our intellectual appetites been satisfied today, um, but hopefully at least some of our other appetites might be satisfied <laughs> um, over wine, uh, cheese, uh, soda water, and, uh, uh, and cured meats over there. Um, but uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't invite you all to join me um, in thanking uh, not only Father Brock, but our full panel here for bringing uh, this wonderful uh, gift for our intellectual appetites today. So please, uh, and thank you, Stephen, as well, for moderating our conversation. Thank you.